So you're struggling with post-concussion symptoms and you're wondering why recovery feels so slow. You're doing all the right things. You're doing exercise. You're doing your visual vestibular rehab. You're eating clean. Could your hormones be holding you back? So in this video, we're going to break down the critical connection between concussion and hormonal dysfunction, how it could happen, what symptoms to watch for, and most importantly, how to test and a little bit about how to treat it. So I'm Dr. Mark. I've helped hundreds of athletes from pro to youth players. I've helped their grandparents, I've helped entrepreneurs, I've helped everyone in between overcome post-concussion hurdles using integrative and evidence-based approaches. And yes, hormones often play a huge role in this process. So let's dive in. So to kick this off, let's zoom out and let's talk about how do hormones, kind of these nebulous molecules that go all over the body, how do they develop problems after a concussion? How does a head impact relate to your estrogen. So after a concussion, your brain undergoes something called the neurometabolic cascade. I've talked about that a thousand times in different videos, but essentially it's this mechanical event that leads to inflammation, disrupted blood flow, and these mechanical forces are all to blame for that. And some of those mechanical forces may impact critical structures like your pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland, this tiny little thing that sits kind of above the soft palate, behind the bridge of your nose, it's this tiny little control center tucked beneath the brain where it helps regulate. It's kind of the top of this pyramid for all the hormones, not all the hormones, but most of the hormones in your body. And so damage to the pituitary, even dysfunctional kind of stretching and shearing can lead to things like growth hormone insufficiency, low testosterone, adrenal insufficiency, and more. So an athlete may be fatigued, losing muscle, struggling with focus, thinking, okay, this is just a vestibular issue, or it's just a cervicogenic issue, or I'm just stressed out, or I'm not sleeping well. And that all may be true, but it could also be hormonally driven. So let's talk about how common this is. The pituitary gland is highly susceptible to trauma. It's just in the bottom of the cella tersica, this little bony kind of compartment in your skull. And so it's it's susceptible to trauma when your head shakes at, you know, 60 to 160 Gs. And research shows that hormonal dysfunction can occur in up to 30% of mild traumatic brain injury cases. So that's concussion. And then as high as 50% in moderate to severe TBI cases. So we'll see things like growth hormone uh, deficiency or insufficiency. We'll see that range from like 5 to 40% of cases one year post-concussion. We'll see adrenal insufficiency or deficiency, things like low cortisol, particularly in athletes who are under stress where that HPA axis, that hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is involved. And we'll see sex hormone imbalances, especially prevalent in chronic post-concussion cases, so testosterone, estrogen, things like that. Other data shows a 42% prevalence of pituitary dysfunction documented in military veterans with blast-related malotraumatic brain injuries. And so this kind of highlights how persistent and debilitating and prevalent this all can be in post-concussion. A special note on women, because concussion research is finally looking at like all females and, and considering females more in the concussion data, like about time. And we see that about 18% of female concussion patients experience menstrual irregularities or hormonal imbalances within 90 days of the injury. And again, this is often due to that pituitary dysfunction affecting luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, estrogen, their production and regulation. And so this can lead to missed or irregular periods, mood swings, difficulty with energy and recovery. And so when left untreated, this can delay athletic performance recovery and increase long-term health risks like bone mineral density loss and things like that. So let's take a minute to break down the most common deficiencies we see associated in the post-concussion, post-TBI literature, and generally speaking, what that deficiency feels like. So not necessarily for concussion, but just if you don't have enough growth hormone, if you don't have enough testosterone, what does that feel like? And you'll see that, wow, that overlaps a lot with post-concussion symptoms. So growth hormone deficiency, we're going to see fatigue, poor exercise tolerance, weight gain, and brain fog. Hypogonadism, so things like low testosterone, low estrogen, we're going to see low libido, mood swings, and muscle loss in men. We might see menstrual issues in women. Adrenal insufficiency, we're going to see fatigue, dizziness, nausea, poor stress management. For thyroid dysfunction, high or low, we could see sluggish metabolism, weight gain or weight loss. We could see heat or cold intolerance. We could see thinning of the nails or your hair. And then prolactin issues like hyperprolactinemia, we might see menstrual problems or infertility. What you'll see is the overlap with a lot of these things is that it can affect your mood, it can affect your energy, and it can affect your recovery outcomes. A lot of that looks like post-concussion symptoms. So if you have the fatigue, you have the poor exercise tolerance, you have the weight gain, you have these sort of nebulous symptoms, how do you know this is you? How do you know this is related to your hormones? Typically, what I recommend is going through the standard evidence-based concussion assessment flow. 
get a symptom score, get a vestibular ocular motor screening, get a neurologic exam, get exercise tolerance testing, do the, the low hanging fruit, high yield things first. But if we're really kind of certainly concerned that there's a hormone issue present, one of the things you can do in the first couple of visits, get a thyroid panel, get some cortisol testing, and maybe look at some of the sex steroids and a screening for growth hormone. So the thyroid panel, typically what your MD or your primary care physician is going to do is they're going to measure, measure a TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not enough. You want to look at TSH. You also want to look at T3, T4, and then antibodies. So antibodies to thyroglobulin and thyroid peroxidase. So anti-TPO and anti-TG. That's your thyroid panel. So TSH, T3, T4 anti-TPO, anti-TG. At a minimum for the cortisol, you would want to look at a morning cortisol, but I like a multi-point cortisol, so a four to six point cortisol. And that's where you're testing your cortisol through usually saliva at multiple times of the day. And so what we actually get is the rhythm. So do you have a normal cortisol awakening response? Do you have a normal dip at night? Does your cortisol not rise and then peak at night? We get to see how your cortisol actually moves throughout the day. And if that affects you. If your cortisol doesn't rise in the morning, you're not going to feel like your brain ever turns on. We can look at a testosterone and estrogen and then the growth hormone screening, we would look at something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, and that's going to be a proxy for growth hormone. If we want to do more advanced testing, this is going to be for persistent cases or maybe we found something in the initial screening that we want to look at further. So we might need some dynamic tests. Say for growth hormone, we would look at an insulin tolerance test. We might even do something like a glucagon stimulation test. For cortisol, we might look at, if we're worried about a true adrenal insufficiency or a true adrenal kind of problem, we might do an ACTH stimulation test to see, can we even spike cortisol at all? Or is there a legit problem in your adrenal glands? Again, if there's persisting beyond three months and you haven't had the the checklist that I talked about, a symptom score of VOMS and neuro exam and exercise testing, do that first. But if you had all that and you're still kind of stuck in rehab, Don't ignore this. Testing these hormones might be the missing link in your recovery. So let's talk about the solutions. These are the treatment options that show up in the research. These are very conventional. This hormone is low. Let's replace it type things. Uh, But there are some integrative things that we can do. There are some not as direct as hormone replacement, but there's some botanical things, some nutraceutical things that we can do to play with your hormones. That's going to be on a very one-on-one basis. I'm not going to make those recommendations through a YouTube video. Uh, So growth hormone. If we find growth hormone deficiency or insufficiency, guess what? Low dose growth hormone replacement and monitoring those levels closely. The thing to know about the growth hormone literature is we see that that uh, shows up a lot. It overlaps with PTSD symptoms. It's uh, brain fog and fatigue and cognitive symptoms. We find associations with the gut microbiome here. Uh, We see it very common in the literature. And so one of the studies, recent studies that was looking at, okay, we we found the growth hormone insufficiency. What happens if we replace it? All these things got better. Everyone felt better. But what happens if we take it away? Well, all those symptoms come back. And so what we're seeing with the hormones is the research is kind of acknowledging like, hey, the pituitary might play a role when it's shaken up, like go figure. Uh, but we're not quite there on on fixing it yet. We're there on sort of replacing things. So growth hormone, replaced with growth hormone. Adrenal insufficiency may be replaced with cortisol, hydrocortisone. Hypothyroidism, we might start with levothyroxine to restore thyroid balance. Prolaxin issues, we might use dopamine agonist. So the game is whatever's low, let's sort of replace it. One of the things you'll also see in the literature here is because growth hormone is so prevalent, what we'll see is that they the guidelines want you to address other hormones first. So if growth hormone is there and adrenal stuff and thyroid stuff and, you know, sex steroid stuff is there, address the sex steroids, the thyroid and the adrenals first. See if growth hormone regulates on its own. If you've addressed this other stuff, then go into the growth hormone. So they typically don't say to treat growth hormone in isolation. Now, again, that's very conventional. I also integrate dietary interventions to optimize recovery. You can't build hormones without proper caloric intake and all this other fun stuff. So we might use, again, just dietary. What are your three to four pounds of food made of? Omega-3s, creatine, diendomethane, and acetylcysteine, all this other fun stuff that is going to impact a liver metabolism and hormone regulation from a much more gentle upstream sort of effect. So to recap, what you should know about hormones and concussion recovery is if you're experiencing fatigue, mood issues, poor performance, long after a concussion, and you've done all the appropriate concussion things, this might be the missing piece. 
So get started, address imbalances. Don't forget about your lifestyle and foundations of health. Poor sleep, poor diet, poor exercise is all going to impact your hormones, but this may not be your brain directly. So if you found this video helpful, go ahead and like, subscribe, hit the bell, do all the YouTube things. It's free for you. It super helps me. Go ahead and also share your recovery story or any questions in the comments. I try to get to those within about a week of seeing them. Until next video, I'm Dr. Mark.